Well, as we established in the previous lesson, Brio Insurance Group is a for-profit business. And so as a business, we have business policies that must be considered. So here's some of the considerations we're going to talk about in this lesson, this sub-lesson. We need to look at regulations. We need to think about export controls. We need to be aware of legal requirements, geography, and data sovereignty issues. Also, what about the jurisdiction that you're in? Let's look at regulations first, okay? Security strategy is significantly influenced by the legal ramifications, okay? The, the civil and criminal laws in your country. Regulatory requirements for privacy, for intellectual property, contract law, civil and criminal law, which will be different between the EU and the United States or Canada and Mexico. It just depends upon your jurisdiction. Different business units or regions, they might have separate mandates, okay? They might have different cultural approaches to privacy. You may have differences in Japan, for example, let's say you would have in Brazil or the United States. Regulations concerning internet business especially. Think, think about tariffs and taxation issues. The global transmission of data, okay? Whenever the military or the government is involved in each one of those countries, in you know, this, this state-based movement of data, that's gonna be a critical factor. A trans-border information flow, and it could be trans-border here in North America or the different areas, the different states of the EU. Think about the export of cryptographic mechanisms. Also, regulatory compliance is just like any other risk that must be assessed. And often, when we think about risk assessment, we focus on exploits and malware. But remember, regulatory compliance is just another one of those risks that needs to be added in the risk register. So let's suppose that Brio has just brought on a client that's involved with exporting software to a number of other companies. So as the CISO, you should inform them about the added restrictions and costs. You must obey the laws concerning contraband and export restrictions. The Department of Commerce's Business of Industry and Security, BIS, actually controls non-military cryptographic exports. Since 2009, non-military cryptographic exports from the U.S. have been under this organization's umbrella. And there are limitations when exporting to declared rogue states and terrorist organizations. So crypto systems have to be registered with the BIS when you're exporting what is termed mass market encryption commodities, software, and components with encryption exceeding 64 bits. And that ain't much, okay? Also, other items require singular BIS review and sometimes notification when exporting to other countries, actually most countries, okay? The militarized encryption equipment must be provided an export license. Now, export destinations are classified by the EAR into four country groups, and we can see these here up on the screen. You've got B, D1, and E1. Those are the, like the three main ones. So for the purposes of encryption, groups B, D1, and E1 are important. So for more information, you can go do a web search on the Bureau of Industry and Security Cryptographic Controls. We also want to consider legal requirements. Most law departments focus on contracts and stocks and security related matters, okay? Mergers and acquisitions, liabilities, HR issues or disciplinary issues, maybe the Warren Act, but legal departments and law firms are not always up on regulations and cybersecurity. And so we have to realize, do we have an in-house legal department or do we have a third party firm? And you know, how knowledgeable are they on regulations? How knowledgeable are they on cyber issues? And usually, as we find out, not really, okay? We have to find the proper legal review and interpretation. So it may involve a different team than your in-house legal department, okay? Maybe a separate firm for consultancy. And this is gonna be influenced by privacy laws and security, GLBA, PCI DSS, HIPAA, and Sarbanes-Oxley. And the requirements are gonna differ depending upon your jurisdiction or your region. Let's look at considerations for geographic and data sovereignty 
there are a lot of differences in customs, in perception, in behavior from a cultural standpoint. If you go from, let's say, Japan to the Middle East, let's say Saudi Arabia and those states, and then the EU, the United States and Canada, there are a ton of difference, okay? Even thinking about uh, the customs in the Far East as opposed to the West, okay? Those are differences that we must take into consideration. And at Brio, we do have a handful of customers from other countries in the EU and the Far East. So we must be cognizant of this at all times. And as a CISO, it's definitely going to be in your wheelhouse to be up on these things. Policies, controls, procedures that differ based on the country or the region. Okay, One country may be under different mandates than another. And there's different approaches in different countries and different continents as opposed to enterprise and security architecture. For example, uh, in France, you have the A-G-A-T-E. I'm not even gonna begin to pronounce that because I don't really speak French, okay? Well, a little bit, but not to, in this video, okay? So the A-G-A-T-E in France is a framework for modeling computer or communication systems architecture, okay? Uh, you've also got the integrated architecture framework of Capgemini, okay? That's also in France. You have the IDABC, which is the Interoperable Delivery of European E-Government Services to Public Administrators and Businesses and Citizens. Okay? That was a EU program launched in 2004 that promoted the correct use of information and communication techniques. Okay? Uh, there's the ICT, Information and Communication Technologies for Cross-Border Services in Europe. There's also Obot or Kubashi, Q-B-A-S-H-I. The Kubashi methodology provides a framework and a method for capturing, illustrating, and modeling relationships and dependencies and data flows between IT assets and resources in a business context. So other concerns for sovereignty and jurisdiction, uh, especially critical when it comes to cloud computing, which some countries are farther ahead of the game when it comes to cloud computing than others. And that's a consideration as well. The cloud has actually kind of removed some of those boundaries, okay? It's fragmented traditional geographic boundaries and therefore it has blurred some of the jurisdictional barriers. And that is a challenge for us as security practitioners. There's a lot of new regulations out there that are demanding that data actually be stored in the country where the consumer resides. So at Brio, we have to think about that complexity and some of those uh, demands that are being made. It's easier for foreign plaintiffs and foreign governments to access or assess data if it's within their own jurisdiction and outside of your jurisdiction. Let's look here in this particular diagram. On the left-hand side, we have some provider considerations on the right-hand side, let's look at consumer considerations, okay? So the provider has to think about, so let's say we're the provider at Brio Insurance Group, okay? And our consumer is a up, upstart or a startup software developing company. So some of our considerations at Brio are the cost of doing business in other jurisdictions, uh, applicable laws and regulations, uh, laws that are adjudicated in foreign courts as opposed to domestic courts, government intervention, which can be a whole different animal in one country versus another, okay? We're seeing things right now uh, happening, for example, in Spain. And we have areas of the planet where certain provinces and certain parts of the company are kind of breaking away for independence. That's an issue. If you're doing business in one of those kind of breakaway states or breakaway provinces, that's going to be an, that's going to have an effect on your business. Different consumer demands, okay, geographically, and how do we come up with a way to seamlessly and flexibly integrate into some of these complex solutions? So that's a provider consideration. On the right side, we have consumer considerations. Okay, how do they protect their data? How do we control their access? What about endpoint security for the consumer? Do they have compliance issues? How do we enforce the CIA triad for our customers? What kind of laws and liabilities do we have for customers and clients? We have to think about intellectual property and copyright laws and trademarks. It's very complicated, okay? And data ownership 
portability and transferability. And this gets back to the point that I made that your in-house legal department or even the law firm that you employ may not have the expertise in some of these very specialized areas when it comes to IT and information security. We need to have in-depth knowledge of laws and regulations. We need to keep our data local. We need to have encryption management and key management and realize the limitations of cryptographic exports. We need to think about access controls that are remote and go across boundaries. We have to think about our different security and privacy issues, geo redundancy. So are we gonna have multiple copies replicated in multiple areas if we're doing international business, for example, if we're a global company, Think about you know, how Google and Amazon Web Services will replicate and, and, and have their data that is copied uh, in one continent and another. You know, copies of your information that you have up in Google Cloud Platform or Compute or in Big Data or Big Query, it's actually going to be distributed uh, across multiple continents, most likely for high availability and redundancy. So geo-redundancy is a big issue, especially for the cloud providers. And what is your ability to keep up with constant changes?